Hello and welcome to New Mexico Rising. My name is Dan. You know, each and every week I try to bring people from all across the country to talk to me about cool things we could do right here in New Mexico. On this week's show, we got this. Is they'll get to see uh, aspects where potentially the flights didn't go so well um, and how we handle that, how we risk mitigate is what we say in the Navy, uh, those situations. Swimming, hiking, camping, cooking, robotics, you know, you, you name it, the list is long. And through all of those things, they get to explore. They get to find out what they're interested in. Reducing the weight of our glass bottles, and we did so by about 10%, but we knew we could do more. And that's when we started exploring aluminum. All of that and more right here on New Mexico Rising. Facing a critical shortage in public health workforce, Public Health AmeriCorps steps up as a beacon of hope and opportunity. So joining us today is Michael D. Smith, CEO of AmeriCorps, to shed a little light on the innovative partnership with the CDC, and not only replenishing our public health ranks, but also ensuring more equitable health outcomes. Michael brings a wealth of experience for in fostering social justice and community service, making him an ideal voice to discuss the transformative impact of the public health AmeriCorps. Welcome to the show, Michael. How are you? Dan, doing well. Good to see you. And hello, Albuquerque. Well, it's also good to see you too, my friend. Um, what are the challenges currently facing the public health sector? Well, Dan, I think you know the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, exposed so many challenges that were right under the surface in our communities, uh, whether they were health disparities or challenges we were having in the school systems, uh, but it also exacerbated them. And one of the problems it exacerbated was the shortage that we were already having on public health workers. Uh, there was a recent study that showed we are missing 80,000 public health workers that state and local communities so desperately need. So what public health needs does Public Health AmeriCorps actually address? So Public Health AmeriCorps is a partnership between AmeriCorps, which is the federal agency for national service, along with CDC, as you mentioned. And we're trying to do a couple different things. One, uh, bring in people power to address urgent health care issues right now, public health needs right now, while also providing the training, the certification, the credentialing, the coaching, so that those folks who are serving in their communities end up staying in the public health workforce. So how does Public Health AmeriCorps benefit members, partner organizations, and all the communities that they serve? Well, it's benefiting, benefiting communities and partner organizations because you've got folks that are working on opioid abuse. They're working on food insecurity. They're working on youth mental health challenges. All of these challenges that our communities are facing and don't have enough people to, to tackle those challenges. But for the members, we often talk about this idea that service can be selfless, but there's also a little selfishness in it that's okay. When you serve in Public Health AmeriCorps, you get a stipend to help you pay your bills while you're serving. Uh, you get an education award to help you pay off those student loans or to uh, pay off post-secondary education. And then you get world-class training and coaching that will help you to accelerate your career in the public health workforce. Michael D. Smith, where can we go for more information about all this, my friend? So if you are ready to serve, we've got thousands of opportunities that are available today in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, all across the country. They can go to AmeriCorps.gov slash public health and find an opportunity uh, today. Michael D. Smith, thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Thank you, Dan. Have a great day. Dive into the high-flying world of the Blue Angels with our next guest, LCDR Monica Doc Borza, as the Blue Angels' fourth female physician and flight surgeon. Monica has been at the head of over 560 thrilling flight demonstrations across North America. Her remarkable journey from the beaches of Virginia to the skies with the Navy's elite squadron not only inspired countless individuals, but also highlighted the dedication and precision of naval service. And today she's going to give us some upside, uh, insights on the upcoming documentary, The Blue Angels, and her exceptional performances and experiences. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Monica Borza. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. All right. So growing up in Virginia Beach, you were surrounded by the sights and the sounds of the Navy jets. How, how did these experiences influence your decision to pursue a career in the Navy and eventually as a flight surgeon for the Blue Angels? 
Virginia Beach is such a wonderful town to grow up in because of such the heavy Navy population that is there. And so you get to see fighter jets flying over from a young age and have that passion and kind of patriotism just deep down uh, inside that kind of inspires you to, hey, maybe one day I could be in one of those jets. Uh, and so that's what kind of led me to join the military and having a family member in the military prior is my father and seeing his relationships when he was in naval aviation. It is just so special uh, and there's nothing like it. And so I was incredibly, incredibly honored when the Navy decided to pick me as a doctor for them. And then even more honored when they sent me through flight school to be the flight surgeon uh, for a squadron. And then to top that was selected for the Blue Angels. And that is you know, the elite ultimate squadron in the Navy. And that is something that a lot of people get to aspire to. Um, and some don't make it. However, it is a team effort to get you there. It wasn't just me. And I have to thank all my friends and family and those mentors in the military who came together to help this dream and come true. All right. Being a part of the Blue Angels demands exceptional performance, both in the air and on the ground. Can you share some of the most like challenging moments that you faced while you were with the team? And how did these experiences shape your approach to teamwork and the feelings of leadership? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the most challenging aspect, I would say, of being a part of this team is we are constantly going. So we are on the road 300 days a year and there are no backups. There's no uh, pilot waiting in the wings to take over or doc waiting in the wings to take over. So you have to be ready to go mentally, physically, emotionally, so that you can put your best performance out there. And it takes truly a team effort of full transparency and trust in order for us to be able to perform in the way we do. And I think that is helpful when we are together nonstop. So we really get to know each other very well so that we can fully trust each other uh, and do a safe and precise, powerful demonstration. And this documentary, The Blue Angels, promises viewers a uh, glimpse in the squadron's pretty much demanding training and uh, show season. What aspects of your year with The Blue Angels do you think will surprise viewers the most? I think uh, what will surprise viewers the most is they'll get to see uh, aspects where potentially the flights didn't go so well um, and how we handle that, how we risk mitigate is what we say in the Navy, uh, those situations uh, so that we could be better tomorrow, so that we can always strive for excellence uh, the next time we go out there to perform. Um, and another cool thing that you'll get to see that has never been shown before is the physical training aspect that these pilots have to go through at the centrifuge uh, to help them combat these G-forces, up to seven and a half G-forces without wearing a G-suit. And that's unheard of. No other flight demonstration team or jet unit per se does not fly without G-suits. So <laughs> it takes a lot of training and it's an intense, rigorous um, program that these pilots go through. And you'll get to see some of them, you know, potentially struggle a little bit, uh, but I won't give the outcome. So you'll have to watch. Yeah, don't give it all away. Yeah, we got to go <laughs> see the <document. laughs> <laughs> yes. Doc Borza, thanks for joining me this morning. Check out the Blue Angels. It's exclusively in IMAX on May 17th or on Amazon Prime starting May 23rd. Monica, thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Let's welcome to an exciting chapter in the new world of chess. As we delve into this uh, evolving landscape and the pivotal role of St. Louis in nurturing the, nurturing the next generation of grandmasters, Today, we're joined by a trailblazer of the chess world, Grandmaster Maurice Ashley, who not only made history as the first African-American Grandmaster, but also has been a vanguard in promoting chess as a means of intellectual and community development. Chatting with us from St. Louis with his new book, Move by Move, let's welcome the man with all the moves, Mr. Maurice Ashley. How are you, my friend? Thank you so much for having me. All right, how is chess changing with this like new generation of players? And hey, chess isn't a topic I usually get to very often, so let's let's uh, get to it. Well, ever since the Queen's Gambit, that Netflix, that Netflix series that was just such a massive success, chess has absolutely exploded all all of our schools. You find corporations are 
absolutely intrigued by chess. I've been getting so many corporate in invites. It's incredible. It's a new phase now. And you see the interest, especially in the digital environment, because back in the day, we used to read chess books. I mean, I'd pour over those books slowly, trying to understand each move, each line. But nowadays, you could just jump online and learn very easily through videos, through digital databases, watching amazing tournaments online, live, getting explanations from commentators or just breaking it down and making it very clear. So it is really, right now, the golden age of chess. So how did uh, St. Louis actually become the U.S. capital of chess? That's what they're saying? It is absolutely the chess, the capital of chess in the United States, as dictated by Congress. I mean, Congress, they, they can't agree on anything, but they agree that St. Louis is actually the chess capital of the nation. And that was 10 years ago. They just recently had a 10-year anniversary of that event. It was a congressional tournament that celebrated St. Louis. And it all started with a couple of philanthropists, Dr. Gene and Rex Singfield, who love chess, decided to start a small little club. Little did they know that it would burgeon and blossom into something that a lot of the city would embrace. They're in over 100 schools. They've reached almost 100,000 young people over the years. They have amazing chess events where the top players in the world come to. They have the World Chess Hall of Fame. They have the largest chess piece in the world standing right outside the World Chess Hall of Fame across the street from the St. Louis Chess Club. So there's just no place in the United States that can possibly replicate the amazing achievements of that club in St. Louis. So can you tell us about this uh, congressional tournament? It was a great event. My first time uh, in the Capitol building, uh, they invited a few students. I think it was about eight students, actually, that were invited. A couple of grandmasters, myself included. And you had, uh, it, was, it was sponsored by Eric Schmidt, actually, Senator from Missouri, and Maggie Hassan, Senator from New Hampshire. And it had other senators show up as well. Ted Cruz showed up. I got a chance to play him. He's not a bad player, believe it or not. I mean, I had to take care of business, of course, but it was a lot of fun. We saw staffers come, uh, Congress people. Corey Bush, who's a congresswoman from Missouri, also invited us into her offices. It was just simply a, a love affair for chess. It was wonderful to see chess being embraced right there in the U.S. Capitol. And in the book, Move by Move, it looks like you're making a queen's gambit to change how we see chess. What inspired this opening move, man? Well, my life has been filled with all these life changing moments directly because of chess. The kind of lessons that I learned from the game, uh, it's it just been so wonderful that I want to share with others as well. Whether it's being able to understand the other person's point of view before you craft your own, uh, whether it's seeing through the lens of a beginner. I may be a grandmaster, but I consider myself an advanced beginner because even now, as I go back to those basics that I learned so many years ago, I am still learning each and every day and reassessing just those wonderful basics. And there's so many more life lessons, whether it's things like learning about sacrifice and risk, being able to judge those properly, and then learning from your mistakes. A lot of people, they make a mistake. They don't want to talk about it, especially in the digital age and the social media age where people blow up mistakes unduly. Chess players, we embrace our mistakes so that we can learn from them and avoid making them in the future. So these are just the lessons that I wanted to share, these and more, in the book. And so that's why Move by Move is out. I also have a children's book out that's called The Life-Changing Magic of Chess. I share some of those ideas, but for the early readers between the ages of 5 and 10. And for those of you that are looking, or for those out there that are looking to get their pawns in a row and start their chess journey, how do they get involved in the world of chess? As I mentioned, it's all digital now. So you need to go to great websites that, and there's so many out there, that cover this game. StLouisChessClub.org is one of them. It has tons of puzzles. It has videos, thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours, in fact, of videos that you can just sit and listen to the grandmasters explain chess, whether it's from some fine point about the game or it's 
doing commentary on the elite events where the top players are playing in and you just get it broken down in a simple way that you can understand, consume, and then be able to apply by beating all your friends. So there you go. They're looking for their next Bobby Fisher. <laughs> Maurice Ashley. Absolutely. Thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. Our next guest is Kayleen Deathridge, an active scouter for 15 years and a national executive board member with the Boy Scouts of America rebranding to Scouting America. Kayleen has insights on this significant change and opportunities for girls and young women in scouting and how families can get involved. Welcome to the show, Kayleen. Thank you, Dan. So why is Boy Scouts of America rebranding? You know, we are now Scouting America to reflect our commitment to serve every youth and family in our country. We want to make sure that every young person knows that they're welcome to come through our door and learn leadership, to build character, and to do all of that through the fun, the friendships, and the epic adventures that we can offer them in Scouting America. That works for me. What are the opportunities for girls and young women in Scouting America? You know, what's exciting is that we now are able to offer girls exactly the same opportunities that we've been giving to boys for 114 years. So that means things like joining a local unit, being able to earn a variety of merit badges, the chance to go to summer camp, maybe a local camporee or even a national jamboree. Uh, we really use the outdoors as a classroom where we give kids skills and through that skill building, they learn confidence, they learn competence, and it really launches them into their adulthood and their futures. So what are some of the benefits of becoming a scout? You know, the benefits are many. They come in the form of getting outside, becoming comfortable in the outdoors. That is the classroom that we like to teach in. Those scouts get to exposure through our merit badge program to literally dozens and dozens of different activities, swimming, hiking, camping, cooking, robotics, you know, you, you name it, the list is long. And through all of those things, they get to explore. They get to find out what they're interested in. Every time they try something new, it reinforces for them that they're capable of learning and succeeding in new things. Of course, we have our rank uh, advancement system. So kids have the potential to go all the way to earn the prestigious rank of Eagle Scout. Um, but what it's really about is just giving them the opportunity to connect with others, to learn leadership and to grow. So how can families get involved in scouting? You know, they're in the Albuquerque, Santa Fe area where we have 220 girls already in the program and about 1,239 scouts total. They can get in contact with the local council office. They also can go online to beascout.org. That website will help them find a unit close to their home and it will walk them through the process of how to, how to get involved and become a member of Scouting America. Thanks for joining me, Kayleen. Where can we go for more information? Beascout.org, that'll give you everything that you need. Thanks for joining me this morning. You bet. The International Code Council is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year and a 100-year legacy of impact on building safety. We all want our homes and the other buildings we use each day to be safe. So adopting modern building codes is an important way to ensure safety. Angela King has more. The International Code Council are stewards of the building code development process, providing communities with the most widely used set of building safety codes and standards in the world, the International Codes or I-Codes. A global concern is the recent increase of wildfire events in areas not historically prone to wildfires. If new homes are constructed that don't meet the latest building code, communities are more at risk of significant damage and cost, putting thousands of lives at risk. The international codes are updated constantly to reflect the latest in building safety and building science. This includes what we've learned from extreme weather events, advances in technology, and the rapid growth of communities around the world. We encourage you to learn more about your local building department and how to work with them on things like remodeling and renovating your home and understanding your community's risks for natural disasters like wildfires and hurricanes. For education and advocacy tips, including a dedicated kids corner with resources for parents and teachers, please visit iccsafe.com.
www.innovationwithjodybogle.org. Today we're sipping on some innovation with Jody Bogle, co-owner of Bogle Family Wine Collection. You know, as we explore deeper into this world of sustainable business practices, Jody is here with a revolutionary shift in the wine industry, a new way wine is delivered to the table. And I'm not the one to reveal this innovative way. Jody, it's great to have you with us. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, so let's get to this. Why do you feel that it's important for businesses to invest in uh, sustainability? We are a sixth generation farming family and a sixth generation family business. Um, we have always kept sustainability at top of mind. It's always been what we've done. We've always looked to the future and looked to the next generation, right? Because that's who we're going to leave everything for this planet for. So a couple years ago, we decided we wanted to look at reducing the weight of our glass bottles. And we did so by about 10%, but we knew we could do more. And that's when we started exploring aluminum. All right. Can you tell us about this uh, new aluminum bottle and how you feel that I, it might yeah. change your company's <laughs> carbon impact and all that? Yep, so this is Elemental, the world's first of its kind, 750 aluminum sh wine-shaped bottle. It's infinitely recyclable. It's obviously shatterproof. It's outdoor friendly, of course, and it's 80% lighter than glass. So um, does aluminum actually affect the taste of wine? You know, that's something we asked ourselves when we started this process a couple, several years ago. Um, quality has always been so important to our family. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever we produced, the juice had to taste good in the bottle. So we bottled the same wine in aluminum and glass on the same day. And for over a year, we did monthly blind taste testing. And we could not discern a difference between the wine that was in aluminum and the wine that was in glass. So we're very confident that aluminum is a great vessel for our wines. So what are the primary benefits to bottling wine in aluminum uh, rather than doing it in a glass? So the glass bottle actually accounts for almost 30% of wine's carbon footprint, which is quite a lot. And with aluminum, you reduce a lot of that. So the weight factor, right? You can get 43% more elemental wine on a truck than you can traditional glass, and it still weighs 4% less. So you're actually taking trucks off the road. There are also places where glass is not as recyclable as it used to be. Glass is also very expensive to recycle, where aluminum is very inexpensive to recycle, and you can do so infinitely. When you're done with this bottle, you just chuck it in the bin, and it goes straight through to your cycling, and hopefully back into another wine bottle to be enjoyed again. Jody Bogle, thanks for joining me this morning. Where can we go for more information about this and maybe pick up a bottle of wine uh, in the future? Yep, you're going to go to elementalwines.com. The wines are currently available at retailers nationwide, so they shouldn't be too hard to find, um, but elementalwines.com. Jody Bogle, thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Thank you, Dan. Preeclampsia is a dangerous pregnancy complication that affects one in 25 pregnancies in the United States and it could cause emergency situations. It's one of the leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality worldwide. Non-Hispanic black women have a 60% higher likelihood of developing the condition. Preeclampsia is a high blood pressure disorder, but the condition could cause other serious complications, especially if it's not caught early. So today, we have Dr. Brian Cavney, LabCorp's chief medical and scientific officer. Joining us to share some valuable information on the condition, the importance of early detection, and recent advancements that will help doctors identify issues earlier. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Cavney. How are you? Great. Great to be with you today. Thank you. Preeclampsia is one of the many health issues that can arise during pregnancy. Are there certain risk factors that can lead to this condition? Unfortunately, preeclampsia is a pretty complicated disorder and there are many different risk factors that you and your doctor need to look for and identify to evaluate your risk. Uh, of course, family history is an important one, a personal history of having had preeclampsia with a prior pregnancy. As you mentioned uh, in the lead, women of color have a significantly higher risk than others of developing this situation. It's also highly correlated with advanced age during pregnancy, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and a variety of other chronic conditions. So 
many different uh, pieces of information that you and your doctor need to sort through. Can you describe the symptoms of preeclampsia and how it's usually treated? Part of the challenge is that most women don't feel any symptoms in the early part of preeclampsia because, as you know, we can't feel our blood pressure. We often can't tell if we're becoming anemic or spilling protein into our urine through our kidneys. And so that's one of the reasons why it's important for uh, doctors to evaluate your risk and use a variety of different screening tools in order to try to identify it early. If your doctor does, for example, suggest that you're at a higher risk of preeclampsia, there are a variety of things that she can do to help reduce your risk of a problematic outcome. From aggressively treating the blood pressure that you may have with one of the medications that we know is safe during pregnancy, uh, many doctors would prescribe a low dose of aspirin to reduce the risk of a blood clot or other challenges. There are a variety of other uh, prenatal vitamins and other things that your doctor would typically do. Uh, as well as make sure that all of the other chronic conditions that you may have are being treated adequately to reduce your risk so that you're in as healthy state as possible uh, throughout the course of your pregnancy. Are expectant mothers able to be tested for preeclampsia? When can those tests usually occur? For many years, doctors have been evaluating risk factors and trying to make a good guess as to the risk of preeclampsia. But over the past several years, some great research has suggested that some measurements that, that can be taken during ultrasound, a derivative of your blood pressure, as well as a couple of very specific proteins in the blood that are related to blood vessel formation in the placenta can be tested in order to evaluate your risk of developing preeclampsia later in the pregnancy. The research currently suggests that the best time to test for those proteins is between the 11th and 14th week of gestation during the pregnancy, typically during one of the prenatal visits at your doctor's office. Why is screening so important and what's the impact of early detection? Well, because most women are asymptomatic and because there are many different things your doctor can do to reduce your risk, that's the perfect setup for evaluating risk and screening for this early in the pregnancy so that then you can take the appropriate measures to try to reduce the risk of a problem and get to a healthy delivery of the baby. Dr. Brian Cavaney, where can we go for more information? Always the best place is your own doctor. Make sure you go to all of your prenatal clinic visits, follow all of their recommendations, fill the prescriptions uh, that they might recommend, uh, think about the activity uh, recommendations they may have, ask other good questions, get information from a lot of the great websites and apps out there. One that we have is called Ovia Health. And then in addition, you can get a lot more information at labcore.com. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Cavity. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. And that's it for New Mexico Rising. I want to thank you for tuning in and checking out the show. If you actually want to be on the show, email me. That's NewMexicoRising at gmail.com. Go to our website, NewMexicoRising.com. has a whole bunch of cool things you can buy, such as merch for the show. Plus, I got books from several of our guests. They give us a couple of copies, so I'm going to give those to you. All you got to do is pay for shipping. So that is at NewMexicoRising.com. Follow us on social media. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Follow our YouTube channel. Until next week, that was New Mexico Rising.